I'm alone in this space. Like, so, <laughs> finally, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the eighth carnival event, um, which is the ongoing program of events that provides um, panel discussions, talks, performances that extend the life of the exhibition beyond the exhibition, bringing the themes of the exhibition into the worlds of discourse, public conversation, and discussion. All of our events are filmed and available online shortly after the live event, so if you weren't able to attend the events in person, please visit the Biennale YouTube channel to view the recordings. So this event, Women, Life, Freedom, is especially significant in our lineup because it speaks so directly and powerfully to the global nature of this exhibition, which is sometimes characterized as being only African or black. The stark truth is that the questions we have tried to raise are as urgent in the Middle East as they are in the Midwest United States or the Maghreb or anywhere else. Questions of power, patriarchy, police control, and the underbelly of politics affect us all. Women of color, people of color, LGBTQT plus communities more than others. But we are all implicated, affected, and sometimes even complicit, knowingly or otherwise. So it's with mixed emotions, therefore, that I'd like to welcome Taranj Kansari and her collaborators to the Laboratory of the Future. On the one hand, I'm profoundly moved and proud that this exhibition can be offered as a platform of sorts. But on the other, I find myself wrestling with despair and anger at the circumstances in which it came into being. What goes through the minds of policemen as they beat a 22-year-old young woman to death? It is usually assumed that colonialism, the process of establishing control over indigenous peoples, only happens at the scale of nations or countries. But in truth, it works, if that's the right term, at both the micro and macro scales, over a single woman's right to agency over the, her future, as it does to an entire continent. The two events, this and the panel discussion that will follow this afternoon, have more in common than might be immediately apparent. I hope that you'll come to both, be moved by both, but also think about the conditions which allow the participants in one group to look to the social media and publicity which surrounds the event with excitement and pride, and the other with a sense of trepidation and fear. These are the real conditions that underpin a program like this, and I salute Taranj and all her colleagues for their determination to overcome that fear and to speak both in spite of and because of it. So thank you, welcome. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Leslie, for giving us this platform. Thank you for being here. So um, I have come to the Architecture Biennale probably for over 10 years. And this one, for me, as a woman, as an interdisciplinary architecture practitioner, and a person of color, is monumental as it shifts what, as architects, we need to critique, unlearn, and system systemically change in order to deal with the planetary and socio-political emergencies that are, that are facing us and will be facing us. Um, and the fact that perhaps we should not be thinking about business as usual this session in particular is about how through shifts in systemic and governance structures, as well as practices, um, can start to in turn shift the architectural practice and discourse. And how we can respond to that as, as architects, designers, and actually artists. Some of us here will share some of our systems thinking, and some of us, our practices. Before we go on to that, I'm going to hand over to my colleague to just contextualize uh, what inspired us to be here around woman life freedom. And the fact that it's not going to be directly this, this session about that, but actually a much more global and much more um, wider discourse around feminist discourse within governance. So I'll hand over. Thank you. Thank you, Taranj, and thank you, Leslie, for that wonderful introduction. Um, 
Uh, my name is Merad Saif. I'm a director at Public Works. I come from performance and uh, public arts. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about woman life freedom uh, and its relationship perhaps to uh, what Taranj was mentioning earlier, to architecture. I've um, taken two elements from the woman life freedom uh, movement. Uh, the first one is that it was a protest movement led by women placing the body of women at the forefront of all the protests. It's important to understand that this is not just to represent women as a biological entity, but as a figure of resistance that becomes the source of um, inspiration for more and more people to take part in the protests against patriarchy. Do you need to change the, the, the lighting? Well, no, you need to change the lighting. Oh, right. Is it the... Oh, no. Do you, is it? We need to project this, the table. The, the table. <laughs> <laughs> you might uh, uh, touch. Hold it. Just see what it does. So, ah, uh, and then the light. <laughs> And also the lighting, is it possible to? Yeah. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Cool. So, yeah. So, just to say that quickly, um, it's not just to represent women as biological entity, but as a figure of resistance that becomes the source of inspiration for more and more people to take part in the protest against patriarchy. I don't know if you can see the, the image of the woman standing there and holding that gesture. Uh, so women, men, members of different ethnic groups and members of LGBTQ community all took part in these protests. This figure of protest becomes an anchoring signifier defined by the way it is situated in the everyday as opposed to imaginary narratives that construct a story or prov provide a defined identity. It is a faceless figure. By definition, it avoids offering familiarity. It is a situated figure. It incites the desire to act out being the figure in different urban and rural situations. The second element of the woman life freedom that I want to uh, emphasize is the role of the arts in articulating and expanding this figure of protest, in providing a horizontal plane where the fi this figure of resistance, and here is a depiction of it, which was also in our uh, uh, installation yesterday, uh, can multiply and expand <clears throat> in real situations, in artistic reinterpretations and representations, and within the dig digital world. So th th I will also make reference to a female uh, participant in the Woman Life Freedom protest in Iran who goes by the name of Elle. And she wrote an essay entitled Figuring a Women's Revolution, Bodies Interacting with Their Images, that articulates the different nature of the, of the, of the Woman Life Freedom movement with reference to the creation of a certain symbolic image figure as opposed to the more orthodox movement of a crowd and mass demonstrations. So to begin with, the woman life freedom movement began with the murder of Mahsa Amini, a 22-year-old Kurdish woman on a fun visit to Tehran, arrested by the morality police for not wearing her hijab properly. She died in the custody of the police from injuries sustained at the hand of the police. According to her parents and her brother, Mahsa Amini had no interest in politics. She was a young, vibrant woman at the beginning of her adult life, ready to embrace the many personal challenges her future posed for her. She was, in other words, an ordinary woman, preoccupied with her own desires and her own plans. 
In fact, Masa's real name, the name used in everyday life, the name her parents and her friends called her by, is Gina, a Kurdish name. Kurdish, however, is banned at schools as the language of subversion belonging to a troublesome ethnic minority. So the beginnings of this women-led protest, therefore, does not only sit within the body of a woman, it emerges from the body of an ordinary woman belonging to an ethnicity whose language is banned. The name Massa is, the, is only the legal name recognized by the authorities at birth. Gina, however, is a name that circulated through her everyday life. Thus the slogan, woman, life, freedom, zan zendegi azadi, cried out at Gina's burial in Kurdish, jen jian azadi, was also chanted throughout Iran and the world in Farsi, in Kurdish, and now in many other languages. On Masa Amini's gravestone, it is written, you will not die, your name will become our password. During the protests, every slogan written on the walls of Iranian cities was signed off with hashtag Masa Amini. In Farsi and Kurdish, both words zan and jen stand for the singular woman. There's a more fundamental aspect to the singular use of the word personified in Masa Amini than the plural use of women. So sometimes the slogan is translated as women, life, freedom. Actually, it's, it should be woman, life, freedom. The fundamental aspect of the singular does not reflect the transcendental essence of womanhood. On the contrary, through the password Masa Amini, the singular word woman becomes an anchoring signifier, the very source of plurality. The singular stands for all the women who remove their mandatory hijab to establish their independence from patriarchy, but it also stands for women who still want to wear the hijab, for men and members of the LGBTQ plus communities who oppose patriarchy, and for people from all ethnic and cultural backgrounds. Now, it's interesting quickly to look at how this figure of, this, uh, figure of protest with the gesture appeared. And, and, and in fact, Elle in her essay says that this was already in us, as, uh, uh, in, the, in the protesters' unconscious. And I was wondering what she meant by this. And we have a quick look at the history of the relationship of women to the veil in Iran. We see why, what she meant by that. So this picture uh, is a picture uh, uh, in 1936 where women were forcibly unveiled. Uh, so this was the time when, at the time, uh, policemen were chasing women on the streets and pulling the veil or the chador or anything they were wearing to cover their heads off. Um, and they, they were supposed to look Western, European, because that reflected the ambition of the then government to industrialize the country and join the modern world. You can see in this picture that there are some of them that they look very, very uncomfortable. They're not happy at all. This was quite a traumatic event in the country. Lots of men committed suicide. Some women never left their houses for three or four years. Was, this was mandatory. So this relationship was one military government taking the veil off. And then, in 1979 revolution, we had the opposite. We had the veil going back on again by another patriarchal government, again, and then the patriarchal hand coming, and uh, after, you know, a few months after the revolution was successful, making the hijab mandatory. And during the woman life uh, uh, revolution, uh, uh, sorry, woman life freedom movement, there was a time when women, Iranian women, began to cut their hair. This sort of went round uh, around the world. And some artists uh, provided some very uh, acu uh, acute interpretations of this uh, action. So here you can see is one, um, which is, you can see that by cutting the hair, you are, in, in this artist's interpretation, you're cutting the arm of patriarchy. A another one, which is perhaps a more famous one, is this one. It's the cutting of the arm of patriarchy and its control over the hair. So it's, un it's really important to understand that the woman life freedom is not an anti-hijab movement or pro-hijab movement. It's about removing patriarchy and giving women agency and a choice about what they want to do with it. Now, the gesture of resistance 
cannot be divorced, divorced from its urban situation, from the way it occupies and undermines the everyday use of space. Elle, in her essay, says that the creation of a certain symbolic image figure, as opposed to the more orthodox movement of a crowd and mass demonstrations, is essential. So during these, these, these protests, you did not have big demonstrations because they, were, you know, they, they would be dispersed very quickly. People would appear in different areas and uh, on, on cars, on roads, in, in, uh, everywhere, just act out this, this gesture that you can see. And here you can see, for example, a, a wonderful, it's one of my favorite images of the protest where this, this young woman has gone to a, 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 it's probably a lane, and on, the name of the lane is Azadi, which means freedom, right? But it's probably just an insignificant lane somewhere in, 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 in a city. And what she has done, she has written uh, Zan Zendigi, woman life next to it, and stood opposite it with that gesture, and a, and a picture has been taken. This is a perfect example of this figure appearing again and again in different situations in urban con uh, conditions and becoming the source of, uh, for, for inciting the desire of others to, to taking part. But I'll just quote something from Elle's essay, which I think is very interesting. This imprisoned time makes a linear narrative of history problematic and highlights instead a topology of the situation, the gestures, the moments, and in the micro struggle that we have been fighting every day. For that moment and all those moments, not for that general narrative, but for everything small. And this is really an important point that she's making. So this movement is not necessarily involved my big national, nationalist identity that we are going to achieve this wonderful ideal and society will be fine after that, or a religious one, or a, another ideological identity. It's about these little moments that people appear. And this is where, if you like, the connection between architecture and woman life freedom uh, expresses itself. This, uh, I'll quickly also refer to the way uh, art comes into, um, uh, uh, into this, which is through the injured and marked body of women. Um, in the woman life freedom protests, women, along with men who supported them, were among the casualties with their wounds and their damaged tissue on show. Women's bodies perforated with shotgun uh, pellets have been actively promoted by graphic, animation, and visual artists parading the wounds and their spilt blood as a way of placing the female body at the very center of the protests. Other wounds sustained on the body, eyes, arms, face, legs, head, caused by bullets and beatings, have also been exhibited in photographs by the victims themselves or by artists in their graphic depiction of the injured or slain female body. Through those images, both real and virtual, the Signify Woman provides what Elle describes as the history of bodies. In truth, she says, what distinguishes this uprising as feminist is this figure-centered character the possibility of creating images that do not necessarily capture the intensity of, co of conflict, the cruelty of repression, or the unfolding of events, but instead carry the history of bodies. So in conclusion, the woman life freedom protests provide three main elements. First, it places the signifier woman as an anchoring signifier for all those who oppose their patriarchy in all its form and make, makes it an essential, if not the most essential component in carrying out um, uh, 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 action against any form of colonization. Secondly, it provides a situated figure of protest as a source of desire that encourages action, not based on a narrative or identity, but simply based on a desire for action and charge in, in specific situations. And finally, the situated nature of the protest is articulated and expanded by artists in real, virtual, and digital spaces, providing a continuous horizontal plane for dialogue and desire for change. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, we've lost your screen again. <laughs> I can't see. Yeah. Um, 
So we're going to, sorry, we've had um, ups and downs with people um, unfortunately having got COVID. So we are going to go into Zoom um, and I'm going to um, show their wonderful um, book and the pages of it and you're going to see them on the side. Now you might wonder what the relationship might be between what Merda just talked about and some of the things we're going to be hearing. And a lot of that is to do with um, this notion of feminist governance through commons thinking, through self-governance and through bottom-up um, kind of uh, systems and bottom-up bottom -up thinking, grassroots thinking. So, um, if we could get Ezra and Lara from the Urban Commons Collective from University of Sheffield, we can uh, move on to this part of the conversation. Can you hear me well? We can hear you. Yes, thank you. perfect, thank you. Hello, I'm Isra John. Uh, I'm an architect, activist, and researcher uh, from Cyprus. Uh, I recently completed my PhD uh, that looks into the intersection of urban activism and uh, cross-border spatial practices in the context uh, of Cyprus. Um, Hi everyone, I'm uh, Lara Schaaf. I'm also from the University of Sheffield, originally from Cyprus, as Esra is as well. Uh, we'll get to that later. Uh, I'm a PhD student, uh, currently in my second year, also trained architect, urban designer and researcher. And I'm working on my PhD that has to do with radical imagination and its conception uh, in the work of architects and spatial practitioners, specifically in context, context uh, around the globe. Well, we're currently in Chef, uh, in Venice. Yes, we are. <laughs> but we're not in the room because we are both uh, suffering from COVID, but it's still positive. So I just want to thank everyone there to make this online connection possible. And uh, I'm very happy to see Urban Commons Handbook uh, on the table uh, to hopefully contribute in to how we think about self-governance through the situated practices across different uh, geographies. So we are members of Urban Commons Research Collective at uh, Sheffield, uh, University of Sheffield School of Architecture, but we have members across different institutions uh, in Europe. Uh, you can see the cover page of Urban Commons Handbook. It's, the, it's basically a collective effort of uh, academics interested in the notion of urban commons, but it is much more than that. It is an outcome of collaboration of seven practices uh, from seven different countries across the Europe. And today this handbook will be our guide in revisiting some of the practices that could inform our thinking on urban commons and decolonizing uh, governance. Can we go to pages, next page please? Yes, perfect. Who are we? Uh, as I said, we are, we are researchers, but we are much more than that. Most of, our, most of us are practicing, we are activists, uh, and we, we kind of use the tools from both uh, spaces. Uh, what we do best is we organize workshops and seminars and we invite people that we can learn from to understand how urban commons is studied and practiced and study the potentialities of urban commons to build collective fronts against the capital-oriented development crisis that we experience today. We regard commons as a means to generate social practices and processes that can maintain, reproduce, and reinvent our lives in times of uncertainty. We, our interpretation of commons uh, foregrounds its political goal, a process that involves governance of collective resources and um, a potential form of social organization. In this frame, we propose commons to generate processes of social reproduction and ecological repair when the capacity to repair is in crisis or under political and economic threat. 
And our collective turn to commons is about imagining how we may organize our lives together based on principles of care and collaboration. Next page, please. Urban Commons Handbook is structured based on who we are and what we do as the collective, as the members of the collective. Uh, the smallest circle you can see in the middle of the diagram is the co comprises of the members of the collective, and each and every one of us is somehow connected to practices through our collaborative activism or through our academic research. And each practice that we collaborated actually inspired and foregrounded a certain thread of urban commons uh, that structured uh, the handbook. With economies, uh, we address how urban commons can support diverse, non-capitalist economies based on mutual interest, sharing and collaboration. With ecologies, uh, we look into the relations of collective care, regeneration and resilience and how they can contribute to planetary ecological re uh, repair. With infrastructures, uh, we look beyond the common understanding of physical and organizational structural systems, such as uh, streets, railways, water pipe systems, housing. But we focus on the characterization of commons as trans transformational social infrastructures. Knowledges explore collective and collaborative approaches to the generation, management, and dissemination of knowledge ones that are particularly oriented towards social change. Socialities is concerned with cooperating communities and their capacities. Localities focus on values created within and from below, while making visible the broader power relations that surround urban commoning practices. And governance argues that governing the commons is not a question of management, but rather a political project where the common is a principle of self-governance that prefigures the reorganization of society as a whole. Next page, please. In the handbook, we explored self-governed systems together with collective resources and communities of commoners that produce and rep reproduce them. It's page 164. Yes government. The pink page. <laughs> Sorry, it came up. That's perfect. Thank you very much. I can't really hear you well, but I will continue. Yes. yes. Perfect. Yes, in, in governance front, we talk about self-governance and um, we grounded as a local, horizontal, and inclusive practice of decision making. Uh, we talk about regenerative social and environmental ecologies and inalienable goods and rights. Self governance constitutes an alternative to the dominant separation between state and the market, that is, between public and private interests. And through that, marginalizes other modes of governance, not based on individual rights, nor dependent on top-down structures. Next page, please. For the governance strand, we focused on Lasilo, uh, which is a practice situated uh, in Napoli. And it's a community movement that started as an occupation of the abundant La Silla building uh, and then evolved into a social movement. Next page, please. What makes La Silla interesting to study is their relation to governance. Uh, it's in their ability to initiate legal structures and communication lines with administration with centralized administration to support communal action and give them space within decision-making processes. They propose legal hacks for instituting a common self-governance model that could contest and coexist with the centralized governance models. Um, they basically work around their declaration of the use of LASILO, where they translate the legal hacks as creative use of law from the part of the community 
And in this case, this is not imagined as the simple regularization of community, but rather a tool to imagine new institutions that are grounded in communities and the power of community. Next page, please. Um, La Silo diagram it shows how the self-organization of society uh, is grounded in constant civil reappropriation of all institutional spaces that affect their lives. The diagram demonstrates uh, the, the tables uh, that are organized around particular issues that the initiative wants to have a say in. And they have regular meetings, for example, they had a meeting that discussed our contribution into this event as well, and how they are supportive and how they wanted their their uh, understanding of governance to somehow respond to global movements as well. Lasilo became an example of community movements that multiplied across Italy, but this was possible within a global north understanding of uh, democracy. And for us, it is important to ask how their tools and organizational practices could help us think of counter-hegemonic social institutions that could exist in contestations of power, ranging between dominant political economic systems of development to Iranian women's everyday exp experience of discrimination and inequality in law and practice. In context characterized by uh, restrictive and authoritarian regimes, the prevailing systems of governance are intertwined with both regional and global political dynamics. And within such environments, the self-governance system operates as practices situated within specific temporal and spatial dimensions and are inherently contingent upon prevailing political openings and opportunities. Um, can we go to the next page, please? With localities, uh, we look into inclusive, intersectional, and interdisciplinary approaches to governance, emerging from a wide spectrum of urban geographies, and look into self-governance systems beyond those of northern or northwestern, global north-oriented, and neoliberal ideas. They're more entangled in constantly agile, changing, and reactive practices that have the potential to create heterogeneous nodes of change embedded in the everyday life. In many ways, these forms are not visibly directed against the authoritarian regime, but are instead more entangled in a contingent constellation of practice, milieu, and materiality allowing people to reclaim their agency in shaping their immediate environments and then the city. These are emerging nodes of power and can subvert the power hierarchies by building resilient social systems that can act within or alongside other systems, thereby providing avenues to bypass various barriers. Contribution of the practices we share here to the women's life freedom movement and the colonizing governance uh, panel here is perhaps by making visible these nodes of power as situated forms of self-governance and looking to enacting translocal alliances as well. We will now turn to Cyprus and talk about our situated experiences briefly as well. Mm -hmm. So as, as I already mentioned, uh, the chapter of localities very much focuses on this uh, idea of how we can understand the urban commons through the localized uh, struggles and experiences that we have, and especially in context with patriarchal, colonial, neocolonial narratives of oppressions, divisions, and otherness. Um, so here, the Hands on Famagusta project, that is a case study explored in the localities chapter, uh, is in a way a project that is very close to me and Esther. We are both from Cyprus, and we are part of the Imaginary Famagusta collective that is uh, the collective that initiated this project. Uh, it's a collect it's a bicommunal collective uh, of architects, which means that we have um, uh, architects, practitioners across the division that exists in Cyprus, so both Turkish-speaking uh, Cypriots and Greek-speaking Cypriots. 
uh, this is sort of going against uh, the context of division and authoritarianism in the context of Cyprus. And in general, as a collective, we try to uh, find ways uh, to advocate for the role of spatial practice in reconciliation pro processes uh, more generally, but also in uh, issues of pluralism and multiplicity within decision-making processes. So in the context of Cyprus, because uh, thinking about um, a unified Cyprus and a country under a federal state requires a very large ongoing reconstruction processes, uh, a lot of investment, a lot of political negotiation that uh, are aimed to, uh, in a way, end uh, the division and unify the country. We, in a way, through the Hands of Magusta project, claim a counter position by bringing different modes of reconciliation and solidarity to claim the processes and our role within them uh, of the urban regeneration and the urban commons. So, in a way, we develop urban scenarios, alternative urban scenarios, for advocating for the role of urban commons in the future of a non-divided Cyprus, very much as uh, the whole concept of the Biennale, as uh, the future, the laboratories of the future. If you can turn the page, please. So one of the most important things uh, that I believe that the Hans of Magusha project has established is to find new ways of how urban commons can provide the vocabulary for us to think about our localized struggles, but also our commonalities away from these ethno-national uh, ideas uh, that are very much dominating our narratives. So this uh, image that you can see is a counter mapping of the divided city of Famagosta that usually would be uh, represented as divided into two large fragments, but we choose to counter map essentially the divided city uh, and understanding it through many different fragments through the segregation, urban enclaves, privatization, instead of this large idea of nationalism uh, dividing the country. If you can turn the page, please. So in a, in a way, Hans on Famagusta many times acts as a large platform and as an enabler of spaces that are across the national divisions. They are essentially spaces of encounter that bring people together that would otherwise never sit around the same table. And this might be uh, people like me and another person my age that would have never talked with in the, in the Cypriot context, the former and the current mayor of the city, activists and politicians that would never have open conversations uh, across the division. It's in a way a, a way to build bridges across differences and architecture and the urban commons become in a way a common languages that provide a new vocabulary to talk between us and talk with others and do things together and care about things. Uh, together as well. So in a way we claim counter positions and we imagine the future urban commons while acting in the present. And in this whole context, the imaginary for us has a double sense. So first of all, it's imaginary because we imagine the future. It acts as a laboratory of the future. Uh, we can understand and see and imagine radically different futures for our country. And even if those are not able to be achieved in a very close time frame, it helps us to understand the present uh, and our past to question how uh, we are Cypriots and we are together or apart and, and all of the context. But in a way, marginal is also a very important term for us because it helps us stay in a realm between the imaginal and the real within the, the thresholds of the spaces. And that essentially allows us to bring these people together under an informal scenario because they would never meet under a, a formal and set up space. Uh, if you can turn the page, please. So uh, I think we went forward, but it's okay. I will end here and then uh, uh, we can end the presentation. So um, we would like to in a way question of what the role of architect and architecture is in the process of reconciliation and in the urban commons more generally and asking why us and what can us architects actually give and, and support uh, through the tools that we know. So in a way the tools, the technologies, the material agents such as um, 
models and, and the books and drawing and a lot of things are also very uh, evident throughout the, the whole Biennale exhibition. They support us to build this laboratory of the future to understand our future imaginaries and to also understand through them our past and present and using urban commons as a common language of imagining this uh, and rethinking uh, how we can approach uh, this context of um, dispute and authoritarianism differently. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, maybe it's, this is a good moment to make the transition to La Foresta and uh, Flora. Uh, La Foresta was also part of uh, the handbook, uh, and we hope that it will become a common resource to inform many different practices as well. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for making us, for us. Part, of, part of this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, for joining us, and uh, you look really well, so <laughs> we ho we're hope you get better. Thank you. Um, so just for you all to um, understand the structure, um, it's a, I know we're throwing a lot of stuff at you. Uh, we're going to have a break after Flora, um, and uh, also have any Q&A um, as, as uh, just before that as well, before we go into the next session um, of, of today, which, um, yes, and there's the film, yeah. So, okay. Is the mic? No, yeah, it's working, great. I will just um, set up things here. Hi everyone, <laughs> um, sorry it took a bit. Um, thank you for inviting La Foresta and me to this event. Thanks to all the organizers and all the background work that has been done to organize this. I'm really grateful to be here and with all of you in this space of um, learning and, and sharing. My name is Flora and I'm a member of La Foresta which is a community academy in Rovereto, in Trentino, in northern Italy. And we describe La Foresta as, as an urban common, as a space where self-organization, collective forms of use, management, and also eco-socially just redistribution of material, but also of immaterial means are very, very central to us. And in this contribution today, I would like to share with you some experiments um, we are currently doing or we are engaging in since some time around community-based feminist organizational tactics and tools. Um, organizational also in the sense of how we maybe, yeah, get in touch with others, how we relate to others and how we come together in general. I will also share with you some struggles connected to this um, yeah, tactics and some open questions that I will move around here sometimes. But um, first, briefly, what or who is La Foresta? Here on this image, you can see part of our group in front of our space that is located really in the train station in, in the Rovereto. And actually, this space came about in 2017 through a collaboration with the Italian railway um, company. Um, and yeah, we just wanted to cre have a space to create situations of learning, of knowledge, knowledge exchange, and of just doing things in common. And by coincidence, Trenitalia in this time, um, at this time was looking for someone who wanted to rent the space um, because it was empty. 
And so we contacted Trenitalia and we proposed to experiment with cultural and social activities in that space for three years, but without paying rent. Um, <laughs> and to our surprise, they accepted the offer. And then in collaboration with the municipality in a lot of co-designing activities, um, they renovated the space and it has been made to us available until now. So hope, we hope very much that it's uh, going on also in the future. So here you have a map of the space. It's 250 square meters. It includes an event room, a multi-purpose area, a convivial waiting room, which is very much like in the train station. You just can arrive and wait there. We have a professional kitchen and also a small gar garden, which is you are kind of already in, in the train, in a way. Um, so the location, actually, of La Foresta in the railway station is for us quite important, as it is really a, a, a space of transition and of exchange. It is very easy reachable, visible, and really a key anchor point for the whole valley, because we live in the mountains, I would say. Mm, so even really a lot of activities are now um, hosted in this space. We are also, I would say, quite mobile, so many of our activities are taking place nomadically and travel around the whole valley in general. And our group is not just this few people, but we are around, I would say, the core group is around 25 people, a mixture of I would say architects, designers, gardeners, recyclers, activists, so it's quite diverse, I would say. And another, I would say, 50 people and associations are quite frequently using our spaces on, on a daily basis. And actually everyone can join our group just by joining our activities. And now I want to come to the first aspect. Let me see if this is working. I want to share with you. Um, I hope this is, you can see it good. Um, so the first aspect I want to share with you on how we try to come together, I named Activating Bodily Practices, Feminist Pragmatism and Poetics. Um, in La Foresta, actually, you use food, um, preparation, metaphors, body-mind practices, mediation and speculation, really, in diverse pro projects, um, because they help us to create shared and very easy and simple moments of, of learning. They help us to break down traditional hierarchies of knowledge. They also help us to question what actually is considered knowledge and who is considered in the process of, of transmitting knowledge. I also brought a bit of bread we can share afterwards. <laughs> um, so yeah, food preparation and also the act of, of making together um, is for us really a feminist and, and political practice. And I think one of the practices um, that best represents also this concept is the Forno Vagabondo, which you can see here. Um, and this is a mobile oven that is mounted on a cargo bike, and this oven then stops in different neighborhoods around the city of Rovereto, but also in the surrounding villages. And we use this mobile infrastructure as really a playful means to explore more abstract issues like food sovereignty, biodiversity um, issues, and, and so on, but also really as a very easy way to stimulate encounters and to reach people in their living spaces and in their familiar environments. So people that maybe don't come to our space, because closed spaces sometimes create a barrier, so we try to, to use also these mobile infrastructures to activate common situations. So for example, we bake in playgrounds and squares, where just a lot of people are coming together after school, for example. Here we had a puppet show, um, and in this puppet show, it was kind of explained in a very easy way how the seed um, transforms into a flower and who is involved in this. Um, like what actors, more than human and human. And sometimes we collect just, just herbs in the park and then we make pesty and flatbread. And while we are doing this, we are talking about biodiversity, for example. 
So for us, this mobile oven is really a kind of mobile commoning unit of, of La Foresta that helps us to reactivate common spaces, common urban spaces, and also brings together different people from yeah, diverse backgrounds through the simple practice, for example, of, of bread baking or fermenting. And on the same time, we try to, to prompt still questions of yeah, what economy do we want to see in our valley? What kind of agriculture? So, yeah, also these more abstract topics are kind of, um, yeah, tackled to a very simple practice. Um, but at La Foresta, there's not just the oven, actually, there are very different working groups um, using food and other bodily practices to build relationships between humans and more than humans. There is a collective SCOBY that is fermenting and talking about a plant-based diet and animal rights, and there is Comunità Frizzante, which I explain later a bit more. They are doing participatory drinks, for example. I'm just changing the setting. <laughs> So, um, no. <laughs> this one, and we have, I'm not sure if this is working. Yes. Um, another aspect we are experimenting with as a feminist strategy is allowing curiosity and also avoiding over design, not only in the creation of learning spaces, formats and infrastructures, but also in the way we communicate and connect with others, in the way we structure also our meetings and we organize in, in general. So like this, I would say, oh, this is not difficult. Um, tiny pores in, <laughs> in this um, bread, maybe you can see them. Um, yeah, we, we try to create various access points through our activities. So instead of really meticulously planning every detail, we try to keep things very open, allowing for rough structures or purest arrangements. And this allows us to, yeah, to have some possibility also for change within our formats and also to adapt better to, to situations and the people joining us. For example, with the mobile oven, I never knew who actually is joining us for an activity, so it was impossible to plan it very much in detail. So this is really important us to, to get also yeah, different people together. So most of our commoning situations are actually quite messy. <laughs> um, and also the same goes for materials. So over perfectly designed materials can really create a barrier. For example, in 2019, when I first arrived at La Foresta, I designed a small diary for a fermentation workshop. And soon I realized actually that participants hesitated to interact with this diary because they were just a bit afraid of yeah, destroying it. It looked just too polished. So this and other examples um, have taught us that excessive design and over-perfectionist can sometimes ex exclude or deter people that actually we want to engage with. Um, yeah, and one project that, that maybe exemplifies this ethos um, is Ecolab. So here, this is the situation of the Ecolab, which is a collaboration with the Mental Health Center in, in Rovereto. And in this project, we aim to, to create moments of convivial and mutual learning in a non-stigmatized environment. So every Tuesday and Wednesday at La Foresta and also in other locations, we have a lot of activities. And these are very easy activities like collecting clay, planting, bicycle repair, and in this activity we did some wellness together <laughs> and self-care. And actually through these activities we create spaces where also our mental health is part of a commoning um, situation. So people just come together, socialize and learn new things um, from each other. So there are no experts teaching, but just people that have a passion and they just want to share something. Um, and actually also through this project, some individuals joined our group that maybe in other infrastructures are treated as patients. And we try really to regard them as just members of our association and they take also part in our decision-making processes, which I will describe later more in detail. Okay. 
Another feminist organizing strategy that we are experimenting with is the repetition of gestures and engagement over longer time periods. And this aspect actually takes um, very different um, forms at La Foresta, but I will just introduce or briefly mention two. So the, the hit and run approach we were introduced in most design schools is something actually we decided to leave behind us because we think that we can't co-create other worlds just with one project. So these gestures, care and engagement actually need to be repeated over and over again. So much longer time spans actually are unnecessary, stable commitments and also this constant nurturing um, is, is required. And this for us means also to adapt a, a less extractive approach in our relationships with other organizations, with other individuals, collectives, and also with others. But, but this approach actually runs, I would say, counter to some local funding logics. So this makes it very challenging to, to us because we can't propose similar or identical projects um, for local fundings um, yeah, all the time because they really expect us to have new partnerships, um, new project ideas. So there's almost no follow-up funding opportunity. So this is something very challenging for us. Um, another aspect related to care is understanding ourselves really as nested, as nested within a larger context, as nested I, I would say. And this means on the one hand that we recognize our interconnectedness with other living beings, but also on the other hand, seeing our livelihood generation as something very interconnected with others, both within La Foresta, but also beyond. And in very concrete terms, this means for us, for example, that we support every individual in our group and all the ideas, so no matter from where they come. And this can also mean that maybe I write a project proposal for someone else who has not the capacity and the time or yeah, just the skills in, in this moment. So we try to also create livelihoods for others and not just for ourselves. And another aspect that we are now doing, or a practice that we are doing since I would say one year, is that every one of us contributes 3% of our income, if we have an income, <laughs> um, in an, a sort of interdependence fund, as we call it. And this is then used if somebody is in struggle or if we need it in future, we just have this um, little fund to, to support yeah, many of us. <laughs> this one. Then we have the iceberg. <laughs> And the ring, I don't know if you see it, maybe like this. <laughs> so one concept and strategy that for sure most of you know and we use in almost all our engagement is the one of the diverse economies iceberg or the diverse economies concept developed by the US Australian feminist economic geographer, geographer J.K. Gibson Graham. And actually, this image um, helps us in, very, in a very empowering way to see the economy as everything actually we do to sustain our livelihoods, whether this involves money or not. So in general, at La Foresta, we consider all activities important and um, also part of the diverse economy, whether paid, partly paid, differently paid or, or not. Um, and one very good example is here, Comunita Frizzante, which is our fizzy drink business. And this fizzy drink business tries not only to interact with the tip of the iceberg, which means um, on the conventional market, but also in all the caring and nurturing activities below the waterline that are very important for the well-being of people, earth, others and so on. So concretely, this, this means that the drinks are made in a participatory process. So for example, we experiment collectively with recipes, we collect ingredients together, and we also design the labels together and invent the names. So everything is, is done in, in common and in, in different learning settings. And this drink, for example, the Apprachata, um, is um, made in collaboration with a local bakery. 
and there we make use of the perfectly eatable leftovers. So the bakery actually just uses the peels of the orange, and in the past they just throw away the, the juice. <laughs> so Comita Frizzante arranged a collaboration, and now we make with the juice this um, yeah, fizzy drink. <laughs> um, let me see. Um, yeah, so this sounds maybe great, but however, we are not managing to um, yeah, have enough re resources for all to have a sense of stability in our group. So most of the people in our network are str still pr struggling with precarization. And discussing money and making also our financial needs transparent to each other and is, is something really not easy, and we do just since one year. Um, but nonetheless, we really try to hold on to, to this practice in re organize regular meetings where we share really our current social material situations as really a means to understand better how we can redistribute our resources um, in a need-based um, manner. <laughs> so do you see? Yes. Another very small tactic that maybe seems insignificant, but it is actually it is very important to us, is um, that we really try to practice radical trust um, towards everyone who is walking through the door of La Foresta. Um, so the space at the train station is actually open from Monday to Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And we take turns in, in managing the opening hours. And for us it is really essential that the door is always open and that everyone can enter. So throughout the day actually many people drop by, just pick up some clothes or warm, warm blankets from our closing corner, or they just have a glass of water or charge their phones. And we really try to greet people who enter our space with radical trust rather than skepticism. This is not always easy, but it's something we really try to practice. Um, at the same time, every one of us has a key, <laughs> or actually a lot of people to the space, which is, I think, quite special. So around 30 to 40 keys um, yeah, are there to, to open the space. This leads also sometimes to problems, because sometimes we arrive in the morning and the door is open, and oh, we, <laughs> we are a bit afraid of that. But still, we, we stick a lot to this um, principle of radical trust that we extend to others um, because we think that it empowers people um, and it encourages also participation and it promotes really self-organization among equals. One minute. Okay, I will try to be as fast as possible. <laughs> it's actually also the, the last point I wanted to share with you, which is this one, which is now more on, on our, yeah, on how we make decisions in our group. So actually we meet um, every two weeks in, in an assembly um, where we discuss all the, the points um, which either need to be talked about, explored together or decided upon. You also see an example of our sheet that we are using for that. So every person can bring an item to this schedule that we call order of the day. And then during the assembly, we have different roles that are rotated regularly. So a time manager, a note taker, a facilitator, and sometimes someone who translates. And in this space, de decisions are taken sociocratically and based on the consensus principle. Um, still, this is a work in progress, I would say. So <laughs> we try to um, change it all the time and adapting it to, to our situation. Um, yeah, maybe just one last point that I wanted to share, that especially um, this question of power within the group is something that we still struggle with. So there are a lot of invisible power hierarchies, and I think this is something that is a very long process, and currently we are looking for methods to not single out individuals, but playfully help us to, to make power dynamics within the group visible. So if 
somebody has a hint, I would be very um, happy about that. And that's it for now. Um, thanks for your attention. <laughs>
if you want to come and talk to us, please do. <laughs> but let's take a five-minute break and maybe just walk around the auditorium a bit. <laughs> if somebody wants some bread, um, <laughs> I don't know if please come. <laughs> I freshly made yesterday. <laughs> Hello everyone, um, my name is Sharon Prendeville and I'm going to take a few minutes to talk to you a little bit about my work and um, I am an academic, I'm an associate professor of design innovation at Loughborough University in London and um, some of what I talk, I'm going to talk about is a little bit more conceptual so I hope you will um, have some patience with me. So as soon as we get the images uh, up, I can um, just get going. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, economic self-governance and design for ecological democracy uh, based on some projects that I've been running for the last few years with the team at Loughborough University. Um, and I just want to particularly acknowledge the inputs of Dr. Anais Carlton Parada um, as well as Dr. Pandora Shipperick to some of, the, some of the ideas that I'm going to talk through now. Great. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so uh, I'll just begin. Um, an overwhelming impetus strikes me to bring her to visit the peat bog near where I grew up. A memory of squelching underfoot, chasing frogs and stacking turf to dry against a white wall in a rural place, far removed from the noise and activity of inner city London. A sense of place, of domesticity, romanticism perhaps, for a life lived in closer relation with the land. Evocative of remnants of a past Ireland, a mainstay of Irish national identity, nationalistic pride, a nod to a past that no longer exists, certainly not there. Nostalgia is an affliction of the displaced. The Irish poet laureate Seamus Heaney implored us not to dwell too long on that past. He said, they've taken the skeleton of the great Irish elk out of the peat, set it up an astounding crate full of air. Peatlands, or bogs, are non-renewable on a human timescale, and as such, extraction of peat is not sustainable. For many years now, I've been working on ecological design, open source sustainability, with a particular interest in ecological democratization through new economic practices such as commoning. As a non-economist, designer researcher, working with artists, anthropologists, sociologists and media historians, I've been seeking to discern the nature of new economic framings and practices. My approach to new economics is very much centered on how um, we can make sense of how material practices and relations manifest in new economics or not. In my recent work, I've been exploring design rhetoric discourses and frames around this conception of new economics, particularly with the motivation to foster uh, new ecological perspectives and practices. And one of the driving questions behind this work has been um, in relation to why commons design projects seem to set up problems in ways that deem certain to fail, or to render highly complex situations um, as reduced to very monocausal solutions, um, or indeed issues. So I'm interested in how ecological frames relate to community practices and in, in the ways in which these might be broken down to better access the world and problematize various invisible assumptions about how that world is. Uh, a project I've been working on, uh, as I mentioned, for several years um, out of Loughborough University in London is called Counterframing Design, Radical Design Practices for S S Sustainability and Social Change funded by the UK Arts and Humanities Research Council, set about uh, tackling some of these questions. And we worked with grassroots organizations who were invested in employing more democratic and egalitarian practices, particularly in terms of decision-making and community building. 
So our work involved mapping frames and intervening in practices in situ through deeply considered culturally responsive methods. This simple starting point um, allowed us to complicate the straightforwardness of things by harvesting meaning of the socio-political context of various different counter frames. We frequently encountered the, the view that all it takes is to get the frame right and we'll get the outcome we want. What about degrowth, which validates growth? Post-growth, not necessarily counter to, but building upon or beyond. Build back better. Build back better. But normal was the problem in the first place. Alongside those frames that seek to operate on their own plane, such as the the work of Kate Raywert's Donut Economics, um, I think Taranj will speak about a little later, or as observed through our own fieldwork, uh, concepts such as community wealth, wealth building or mental wealth. But the thing is that frames contain the thing, but they are not the thing in themselves. What is a nature area? It's wild. Some railings here, a sign there, a stopover on the way for a swim, restricted access, no ball games or barbecues, topiary, conjuring only civilizing notions, prairie planting, no wildernesses to be found here. The bog is both natural and industrial. It is habitat and wilderness, worked land, a source of indigenous fuel, as well as fun, at once a carbon source and store. The idea that certain single issue frames would change the world belies the multi-causality, the intractability that often defies definition of social change. Whilst working on the project, we began to observe ways in which this solutionism or monocausality uh, was being sustained uh, in commons projects. On the one hand, there is a gulf between the work of many academic design um, researchers working in the area of commons, which seems largely delinked from wider questions of political economy, lacking strategy or class analysis, such as why it seems to be those with time capital who participate, or why urban commons projects peter out over time. In contrast to what normal people need in their daily lives, and as distinct from the activities of more organized activists who are operating in a battlefield against capitalism. We also observed how certain models and frameworks for democratic decision-making that are ubiquitous in this sphere, such as sociocracy, uh, holacracy, or polycentric governance approaches, seem to betray how power is often negotiated in the room, um, or obfuscated in consequential ways through such models, in the, but at the same time operate to up, uphold these models. Um, yet, such models and rules fail to articulate who or what is actually left out in such endeavors, or how these structures might actually connect to ecological concerns. These things are slippery, and the slippage sometimes appears to mean that apparent moves towards economic self-governance through commons and commoning, while being hopeful and promising potentially emancipatory ways of living, for sure, end up being depoliticized or decontextualized. Um, rendering the commons as perhaps a utopian site of, in fact, designs from nowhere, as feminist science and technology scholar Lucy Shukman might have it. Is commoning in these endeavors a means, an ongoingness, something embodied and emergent, ephemeral, or is it an end, a process to be defined and followed, a governance mechanism? Consider this reflection from an activist working in cooperativism using a sociocracy model 
every day in their work. I think we all manipulate each other all the time. I think we're just a bit more aware of doing it with our siblings, because it's more with your family, you've got that safety, so it's kind of more okay for it to be on the surface. But I actually think we're all doing it to each other, unconsciously, but all the time. And that it's just we don't really talk about it because it's such a scary thing. It seems like such an evil kind of word. I also wonder if the sibling dynamic or the fact that we had family in the organization caused so much and continues to cause so much tension and complexity. And I also wonder if it created a foundation for quite intimate relations in the workplace. This quote betrays the reality of gendered and power-based relations that depart from such formalistic models. Constructed and circumscribed, designated inside-outside spaces of consent-based decision-making pr proposed in the wider movement appear to reintroduce false constructions of society, such as old ideas about private, what is appropriately private and what is inappropriately public, and which are contrary to many articulations of a feminist commons design practice. Excessive adherence to such formalistic commons models can overshadow or conceal broader feminist and by effect ecological concerns. And this tendency mirrors a wider conceptual split in academic thought more broadly that presents the social and the ecological as distinct domains. And this tendency towards typifying or typologizing is a patriarchal hangover that is at odds with the misplaced intimacy of, work, of workplace life as re reflected in the quote um, presented. Our observations suggest how community structures can become ingrained by the very ways in which wider social norms are challenged by that community. This seems to speak to long-standing issues and critiques in environmental social movement studies, whereby well-intentioned actions to mobilize for change have ultimately served to entrench obsolete knowledge practices. Our reflections thus imply ways through which we can support anticipating such potential outcomes in future eco-social design research and practice. Very practically, in response, we are now working on um, a project called the Uncommon Knowledge Project, which is tr aiming to directly address some of the issues that I've articulated here. Our goal is to develop um, new concepts and practices uh, that challenge overly formalistic models that deplete possibilities for more relational approaches. So such new relations, not just with each other, but also with the land, require new conceptions of custodianship that are reliant on uprooting old knowledge practices much in the way that in recent years, these same rural uh, peatland communities from which I come have seen resistance movements emerge against um, proposed wind farm construction in their localities. These movements present complex responses to the relationship between custodianship and extraction, as they have arisen with renewed appreciation for the ecological attributes of peatlands and somewhat in distinction to the energy sustenance they have historically provided. And this acts against a different opportunity for a new form of custodianship to emerge, perhaps even economic autonomy through potential renewable energy infrastructures. These are frustrated and fraught responses arising in often historically demobilized communities that were once colonized, and yet Pete was, at, at points in the past, also managed cooperatively, cooperatively by these very same communities. Such complex and sometimes contradictory observations point to the multifariousness at the heart of any ecological uh, project of self-governance, whereby what is in common interest is often de facto assumed to exist, but in reality is not given. Um, this points to, I think, the politics at the heart of the commons and uh, also to the you know, profound significance of rural urban solidarities as well as transnational solidarities in this domain. These movements thus sit in stark contrast to the formalistic institutionalist ideas of the commons I touched upon earlier and necessarily demand that a relational politics is placed front and center of such goals.
Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, we're going to kind of move on. And I'm going to actually use the chador for this bit um, and kind of take you through um, this kind of idea of the commons and how, to, how actually there is legislation within the UK um, which, although a neoliberal legislation uh, called the Localism Act, um, is actually a missed opportunity for us to think about grassroots governance models. So centered uh, in my talk, and uh, Sharon also talked about, uh, Kate Raworth's Donut Economics was a really important piece of literature for me, um, because what she did, intentionally or unintentionally, was to position the, um, the state. Oh. If we pull it this way. The market. <laughs> and the commons. Um, in the heart of, um, in, the, in the middle of her priority list, where the earth was at the top and power was at the bottom of that priority list. But we know this is not how um, our current systems are operating. So if we look at these very different systems where the market is about profit and private property, although these are not distinctly these, they have lots of nuances within them. If we have the state, which is about politics, the sphere of politics and public property. And we have the commons, which is much more the sphere of citizens and self-governance. And it's the, the working of these three together, these relationships between them, that actually starts to create these kind of new systems because they all have different logic. They all have a very different idea of what they're good for. And so if we, we need to kind of this patriarchal model in which we kind of always think one system has to have the most power and eradicate the other and replace it becomes a very problematic uh, concept, really. But actually, the collaboration and the networking between those contexts are um, what uh, probably will, will give us some of those systemic changes. So, um, so as I talked about, it was this act. <laughs> And um, what I'm actually showing as an illustrated form here, and bear with me, um, is that there is a, a legal uh, policy in the UK um, Localism Act, which is called Community Charters. So there is neighborhood planning, there is right to, um, right to buy for community groups, there is right to manage, uh, and so on and so forth, and it has a very neo neoliberal concept that actually private organizations can, can do that, so it doesn't have to be the commons. So, but they will do it if we don't, in a way, take that on uh, within, within uh, these types of organizations. I've just realized I have to turn this around for you to, to see it from your perspective. Thank you. So. <laughs> so, as a commons practitioner, there we go, there's the meal, and the eating comes first. So, as Flora's bread, it all starts with eating together, with listening together, with listening to each other's positioning, and allowing for plural voices, different tastes in architecture and design or art, and different ideologies to have a space. Then, it is about 
Sharing knowledge as also was described. Mm, which, way, which way am I going? This is what, here we are. This is what this image is about. Sharing knowledge. <laughs> and, and really that no knowledge is necessarily kind of hierarchical or expert than others. We just, there is, there is very localized knowledge which is just as important. And then it's really about building these relationships through events. So events like the carnival here, like what we're doing here, or street parties, or citizens' assemblies, or whatever it might be, but these events become places where these social relationships can happen. Also places to plant together, to dig together, just everyday experiences start to build those kinds of kinships and relationships. So each one of these images, we have translated them from really abstract, hardcore policies. <laughs> so just for you to, because the, 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 the politicians, the civil servants, and the communities did not know how to translate these policies. So that's where these images kind of come in. So then it is really about then demanding to have those citizens' assemblies. I'm getting the hang of this, I think. Maybe not. <laughs> yes, to demand these kind of citizens' assemblies. Um, and one of those has been um, that, you know, that they are happening, they have the model of them at municipal levels where you have the communities, you, you invite in each local neighborhood the different people who are re residing there to turn up and um, you have different tables as you have here and you can make certain decisions around what policies are being made. Those policies are then there are people whose names are taken from a hat to become steering groups or steering committees. They develop those ideas, go back to the assembly, things get voted on and they come back again and so on and so forth until the final policy is made. And also this goes with funding from the public sector. So if we use this kind of model as a way to kind of start to set up these community charters, which is a social contract between communities and the state, then, then one starts to think about a community public partnership because the organizations become much more validated and constituted than thinking about a private public partnership, which is the model we have at the moment. Um, and eventually, we get to a point where, um, oh, sorry, here we are, and this is the, I'm going to stop on this one actually, and this is the kind of point over these kind of different relationship between the commons, um, where you're engaging at community level, when you're engaging at community level and with the support of the public, you um, start to kind of set up these, uh, these social contracts that then becomes the way that you can kind of engage with others. So, uh, with, with the state, sorry. So I think this, but for this to really happen, the commons need to, in a way, be a sphere within which one can start to uh, be resilient not be precarious and have social um, kind of sustainable organizations within it. So could we, could we imagine these organizations which are on the one hand financially sustainable, on the other hand are doing community development and really a different system of care some of the things we've been hearing about around um, 
doing, um, like dealing with resources together, governing together, and so on and so forth, and making the rules. So for that, that needs to have a very different logic as a space of the social than that of the, um, of the public, which is a space of the politics and policies. I'm going to leave it there um, and allow Rita to come on, um, and we can discuss this further. Uh, it it has to be is that audience facing yeah, yeah. I can oh, help sorry. you just need to get Yeah, so hello everyone. Um, so um, I'm Rita Adamo. I'm going to talk today about um, commons that are based in rural areas. And uh, Meli, we are a collective uh, called La Rivoluzione delle Seppie, which is uh, in Italian means um, squid revolution. <laughs> and um, we started as a, um, we just, these are a group of us, for example. We start as a, as a, as a, as a group of students at London Met. But then, um, and I was one of the, one of the students, and the main idea behind this was to, uh, we were tired of, like, let's say, as an architecture student, to be behind uh, a computer in a way, and really practice outside the university. And um, Calabria, where this rural village is based, Belmonte Calabro, seems um, a perfect place for us to test and, and really exploring new, uh, different way of. Uh, learning architecture or practice architecture and um, now um, and the process through this found, the founding like process of like also developing this collective from an informal group to now uh, we like to de 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 define this a form of practice uh, became also a personal and professional growing as now I'm I'm a lecturer and uh, I'm also based uh, my PhD on how those uh, rural areas can be activated through um, to, through this uh, through the through a different approach to architecture through an experimental of public action and for example in the in the in the in the moment of of what happened in Belmonte we started with that we like to say that we started with a chair that you see here. I don't know if you see in the... We need to move some stuff. Sorry. Uh, you see it? <laughs> no, it's, it's still here. We need to move it a bit more. Here. So, the chair is a chair defined, uh, designed by another collective that we work with because in the meantime the group become more like a network, a container of different, uh, different uh, people and uh, professional. And the chair is, is becoming like a trigger in, within this community and territory. And the chair is uh, like our unit scale. So building uh, this chair became a way of connecting with the community and the way it's been built was also a metaphor of the tools uh, of the tools and the approach we 
create with the with the with the people, because the we bring we bring as a prefabricated element only the uh, the frame the, st the steel frame, and in between the frame the the chair could have taken any any how you say any shapes, and the 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 example was that at the end of the week of this workshop, of the first time we enter the village and we work with a group of um, students, refugee uh, asylum seeker and uh, local people, that the few of them that were at the beginning trusting us, because um, I, I forgot to say at the beginning, I'm from this village, I kind of, my mom from there, so, but I haven't been there since I was 18, because I left, as uh, most of us do, do, when to study at university, because Calabria is one of the poorest regions of, of Italy. So most of, these, uh, most of us usually, if they can, are moving for studying or working. Um, so I came back after 10 years almost uh, to start this project, and in the village some of them remind, re remember me when I was there during summer. So some of, let's say, we had uh, some trust, but not all trust from the community. <laughs> um, and this chair helped us to build this trust. But the, the nice thing is that, or let's say, looking back at this project, that almost the chair, like from the chair, we. We went back to, we, the, net, the year after, the scale of the project was directly proportional to the building of community trust, uh, because we went, the, day, the year after we built uh, the, the room of a, community, of, a, of a municipal library, and this was um, also, we realized that more we, more we grown as a, in the village, more also the temporary community, the, the people that were coming back as students, as professionals, as academics from everywhere in the, in the world or in Europe, were also growing. So there was not any more 12 of us, of us, the first group of students from London Met, but it was a much more bigger community that wanted to come back to this village as a, as a, as a new home. Um, so after this room that was the second level, we arrived to the casa, and um, I will show, I think um, the casa is, well, in this project, in this drawing is here, uh, which is, I don't know if it's easier to see, because it's very difficult, but um, <laughs> anyway, I think it's easy. The, the casa is a project that um, we, is a nunnery house, and um, is a, is a municipal building, is a com so it's a public place, and it was a half, half uh, uh, was, not fi was not finished when we entered, was uh, abandoned, and the municipality, we made a deal with the municipality to take care of this building, and this, was, this became a container for us, a container for where the three communities meet. So it's, a, it's a, uh, where all this synergy happened between locals, refugee, and, and uh, new inhabitants, and where all these activity that today I brought some example of are happening. So, for example, every every week we are making um, we are making project like project with uh, refugee, uh, asylum seekers that are living in the area, especially with children, where we did this uh, ceramic, uh, ceramic, um, pro ceramic um, uh, workshop. I don't understand where it's the, with the white. Yeah. Um, um, where we work with local uh, ceramists uh, from uh, Belmonte that is, built, that is doing workshop with them and they, in this way they're happy to, they are fine to a way to not only be um, in, excluded from the community but find their way to, to work together with the community and um, or we define an atlas of not the usual place that you can uh, work with in the you can you can find in the village so all the emotional like place or the different place you we define in these seven years with student with refugee with the new inhabitants and so the different uh, 
They are more the human ex experience, more than traditional experience. And all of these are defined by our local tools. So there are eight tools we define through the know-how that we've been experimenting during these uh, years. And there are basically eight words, words that I think are used in all these projects we've seen today, but depending how they've been used. And we like to call it glocals in a way that for us is very important is bringing together this global and local community, especially in those rural areas where they're quite, they need this kind of window to, the, to a more um, global reality, but the same way, especially in our situation, um, for student in a particular way it was important to work in those specific uh, territory. And uh, I would say Calabria as well, um, as seen always as a very um, poor area, um, or only known about criminal organization, but I think this is also a way to how you can see a how can talk about decolonizing governance also in a social issue like a very in 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 a situation where also there is uh, this like we see also this not anymore as an op a critical situation but as an opportunity to work with so the population um, the migrant issue and uh, being ra marginalized by maybe the government itself as a the question of a, the, the question meridionale in a way I think in, in England is in English is like a southern issue um, yeah so these are so uh, at the moment the casa is our main place and uh, all, all the activity have been held in there um, but at the same time it's almost like a uh, our office for our practice, so at the moment we are also using those devices to go back to the to the square. So we build different uh, activities, also in other public space, like the we we work in a, in a square, like an abandoned market, and in a, in another uh, in another garden was the garden of the of the village. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you for bearing with us with the challenge of <laughs> performing this presentation. Um, are there, uh, I think we're gonna have a discussion, but uh, if, if, if there are any questions, we'd like to put that to you first, to the audience. Are there any comments, questions? Okay, so um, I, I suppose I wanna, um, come to our panel um, and, and say it would be really good to discuss, first of all, what you think about, I think we need to think about this kind of other space that has its economy, you know, that has its sustainability. It doesn't have to be so clear cut, maybe, in terms of, you know, sphere of community and then the state or the private, or even if we can critique that. But in a way, I think it's really important, we've been talking about these precarities for a long time around these kind of self-governance and different modes of governance which are coming from a different, you know, you can't do this voluntarily. It, it, it is very, very difficult. It brings us exhaustion, emo emotional exhaustion. So it isn't really sustainable as a framework currently. So I just wanted to know from you guys what you think and what, what is your take on that? Sharon, can I come to you first? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree that there are uh, immense problems with volunteerism um, and I'm very cognizant of the types of disparities that that kind of tends to produce, reproduce. Um, but I don't think it's so straightforward. Uh, you know, volunteer work is also immensely valuable. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I think I'm also very, um, you know, aware and, and I observe how, you know, the, the kind of separation of 
spheres can perhaps be a little um, detrimental, I think, to you know feminist work and feminist approaches and. You know, if we look at the history of design studies, which I'm coming from an industrial design background, I'm not an architect. You know, there's consistently and intermittently these interjections by feminist scholars that are kind of recalibrating all the time. And these arguments seem to need to be repeated time and again to bring the, the sphere of reproduction back into the fore. Um, and I very much see that in... in um, you know, in, in, in the Commons discourse at the moment, um, of, not, not in the work presented here, of course, but, um, and there's a, split, a, a, a very gendered split in very kind of techno-deterministic uh, work, and Silvia Federici talks about this as well. So I think, you know, it, I'm, again, I'm, I'm an academic, so I will always be trying to, you know, consider the assumptions at play, but I think that, um, you know, models and frameworks are, are, are important and necessary. You know, reductiveness of, of the world allows us to understand the world, but we need to also step back from that. Um, so I don't think that answers your question, but there you go. Maybe I can just talk about our situation at La Forest and how we are dealing with these um, questions and, and struggles. Um, I would say that at La Foresta, we come from so different backgrounds and we bring very different things with us to this space of, of commoning. So some people inherit maybe a house and are quite safe and they know that they get other land or whatever and they, they, feel, re they feel really safe and others instead have nothing and are quite um, in, in difficult situations. And what we try is really to, on the one hand, to talk about what actually is our situation and to start from this point, so to acknowledge also the differences in, in our group. And on the other hand, then to, to redistribute some of our resources, for example, who has maybe a house. Um, I'm living currently in Bianca's house and she's also part of our group and I pay really a low rent. Um, just to covering the cost, so we and I don't have any <laughs> inheritance. So it, it just to to see, okay, how can we support each other? Who has what kind of privileges, and how can we redistribute that? On the on the one hand, and on the other, currently we are trying really to to figure out how, on the long in run, we can yeah secure especially the question of housing, because the rents in Trentino are really rising a lot, so it's almost impossible to afford um, living and to collectivize um, these. So we, we started a project really two months ago um, to replicate the model of the Mietshäuser Syndicat, I don't know if you know that, from Germany, where they really try to put land and housing from the market forever, and they developed a really interesting um, legal model. So now with the ex asilo Filangeri, um, we try to, to work on this question, how we can develop similar systems in, in Trentino first, and then <laughs> in, in Italy. So just as an example, maybe you want to add. For us, uh, the situation is um, also very, um, complicated because we in the casa at the moment is a building site so we uh, we cannot sleep there but uh, we sublet a private house and that house it was maybe the last time we could su sublet that cheap <laughs> and um, because at the moment also in Calabria comparing to the to the to what you could, uh, the type of job you can find and everything, they also the rent are also kind of uh, high, but also the people that are working in the group are not someone that is from Calabria at the moment, or oh, there are very little people, like not many of us are from there, so people that are, they want to live in Calabria, uh, that are from the group, because otherwise we are all like working remotely. They have to stay in Calabria, but find a job or work remotely, or work with us, but then not pay rent at least. So we are managing in a way that um, at the moment there are a lot of people, not students, that are asking us to spend the time with us for a month, two months, like sort of a digital nomad. And these are helping us, but it's very unstable. 
otherwise public fund. Um, but the idea is to have a communal life that allowed us to basically share um, share the, what, the resources. And also the interesting thing about us, I don't like the word digital nomad, especially when you talk about territory, how you leave those territory, or how you leave those communities, that they are not really digital nomads because they are becoming part of the project. So, so often, for example, it was an Argentinian guy, Fabrizio, he came, he was supposed to stay two months, and now he's there, he moved there for, I don't know, he stays, he's living there for long. Uh, so there are people that, that doesn't go away or people, but it's all very changing quite quickly. So I guess this is the issue. Do you want to say anything or just generally? Yeah. 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 Um, I just wanted to say, so I, I want to get up and just open the chat door again because um, I wanted to do that. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's okay. So, yeah. Um, I think one of the reasons why all these um, different situations are created beautifully by Taranj on, on the Chador, um, and just to connect the, the, the woman life freedom to all of this, is to, um, first of all, to, to sort of distinguish a little bit between what is happening over there in a, in a country where certain freedoms that are, are here in Europe just does not exist. So the issue is not so much, you know, about rent or about other elements. The issue whether you have the freedom, basic freedom, to do certain things. So one of the elements that has developed um, since the protests is that women begin to occupy spaces simply by going there. So, for example, into a park, into a public place, where you are supposed to wear your chador, your hijab, and they go without it, right? And they go without it by doing that. They are creating a new situation, a new form of negotiation with the authorities. Because of what happened before, the authorities no longer just beat them up or throw them out. They also are learning to negotiate. Okay? They prevent them sometimes from going in by saying, no, I'm really sorry, you can't go in. And at other times, they just give up. So women actually manage to go in. I think in that sense, um, uh, I, I, I was watching a, a video of a conference recently um, by experts in oil talking about the, the future of Iran, which was uh, very intriguing because, of course, you know, Iran has lots of uh, sources of energy and oil. And most of them, these experts they brought were from Texas. They were Iranians who lived in Texas. And most of what they talked about was fracking. Basically, literally, have, although they were, they were saying that the environment is very important, but they were going to use fracking as much as possible in order to, you know, uh, um, uh, make money out of it for, for the country in, in, in their point of view. And then also the other solution that they were offering was privatization, left, right, and center. If you privatize, the companies will come and they will make everything profitable, and they will naturally also be aware of the environment. I think this is where, uh, going back to what Taranja was saying when she placed the, the, the public, the, um, the private and, and the common, this is where the, the, um, the woman life freedom movement, through its interruptions, through its situated interruptions, through just women now beginning to, to do these sort of things, offer the possibility of looking in a different way at governance. In this conference, the way they refer to things is that, of course, all of our alternatives, the privatization, the fracking, making money out of this, not the other, will happen once this government is out of the way and we are in power and everything will be fine. But actually, in this situation with women in Iran, they are part of that society and deal with the state as is, and by, for example, entering certain public spaces, they are confronting the space, not in a violent way, the, the state, but in a way of negotiating. So, hence, in, in the film that you saw, you saw the, the faces of the women in, in the Chador film covered. I don't know where that cross is now, but... Oh, there is. Could you, could you pass that? Just the cross. There. It's not a cross, but it's kind of a... 
like this in a way. And if, if I just could quickly remind you of the, of the figure of protest, you know, uh, and, and the way the, uh, the protester Al was talking about how it's a faceless figure of protest and it's the gesture and the presence that matters. And that is in a way what women deal with in, in a sense, with this sign in, in, front, in, in front of their faces. So I think we chose the Chador as a surface for these different possibilities of the commons to, to appear on it, exactly because through cutting off the arm of patriarchy, so to speak, this, uh, this object, which can be seen as some, as too sacred and by others as too oppressive, suddenly becomes uh, uh, an open surface and possibility of real change from bottom up. Thank you. And I think once this is maybe up, I was so distracted by pushing this thing back and forth. I think maybe it's good just to be a little bit clear about um, the, the issue with, with separating these spheres is not really to, is actually the opposite of separating them. It is actually to understand their logic as being different than the same. Because at the moment, a lot of the times, and this is what James Gilligan was talking about, that we should actually separate the notion of the public and the commons. Because by actually making them the same uh, definition, you're constantly having a power struggle that is actually not collaborative. But actually, if you say, let's take the conceptualization of the commons from their distributive theory, which is not used so much, which is about what we do together and achieve together in collaboration and action, as opposed to what we all as a society believe is good for us. These are two different notions of common good. One is a, is, a, is a theory of communal common good. The other one is the theory of distributive common good. And the distributive is not used so much. So what I suppose I'm suggesting is that maybe we are actually mixing a lot of theoretical um, ideas at the moment. And that's what, that what happens is that we end up with mixing the social and the political as one, mixing the market being a communal common good, you know, and a public good with what private public ownership might be, and so on and so forth. At the moment, I think it's too, 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 it needs kind of unpacking and then collaborating. And I think what I find interesting around this visualization of policies, which is on this chador, and I won't go through the different stages because it's quite complicated with the screen, um, was that um, they, they, they constantly move between the sphere of community building on the ground and what you have to negotiate and the state offers. So the assemblies, of course you can also do it within the commons, but it's, it's at the, the scale of it changes when it's at the state level and when it's assemblies which are at 250,000 people that then maybe 2030. So, so I think we then can start to talk about scaling up, and we're looking quite a lot around these policies, around scaling up by looking at also federalism um, a little bit, where you start to have lots of commons which are doing these face-to-face -face relationships, which are doing, you know, it goes back to the history of uh, banned societies, you know, where it was around localized communities. So looking back at history of political organizing as well, uh, of that and, and the abstract state. So it's not about getting rid of any of it, but it's about where they start to work with each other. So what happened with the mod modernism in politics was that that, that kinship the social was kind of deemed unnecessary and was deemed not really important. So apart from the household, now we don't have um, kind of the arena of the social as much. We have the arena of the political, but it's not the same. It is not the same. And I think that's where the, the differences are and we, we just need to understand the differences. And I suppose that's where at the moment the discussions in Iran are happening around the political 
and the social was on the ground. The social was the women, was the bodies that Mehrdad showed. That's where the social was happening. And I think it's that distinction that would be really important for us to, uh, to maybe um, frame. <laughs> um, I don't know what the time is, but I th yeah, I think, I think if, there, if there aren't any questions, we might close here, if, unless there are any other comments from the panel uh, here. No, no more questions? <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Thank you for bearing with us with this kind of um, experimental model of, uh, of kind of a more performative presentation than PowerPoints. And uh, have a wonderful afternoon. <laughs>